Chapter four, Detrital Wash. The desert is, is the environment of revelation, genetically and physiologically alien, sensorily austere, aesthetically abstract, historically inimical. Its forms are bold and suggestive. The mind is beset by light and space, the kinesthetic novelty of aridity, high temperature and wind. The desert sky is encircling, majestic, terrible. In other habitats, the rim of sky above the horizontal is broken or obscured. Here, together with the overhead portion, it is infinitely vaster than that of rolling countryside and forest lands. It is unobstructed. Sky and clouds seem more massive, sometimes grandly reflecting the Earth's curvature on their concave undersides. The angularity of desert landforms imparts a monumental architecture to the clouds as well as to the land. To the desert go prophets and hermits. Through deserts go pilgrims and exiles. Here the leaders of the great regions have sought the therapeutic and spiritual values of retreat, not to escape but to find reality. Paul Shepard, Man in the Landscape, A Historic View of the Aesthetics of Nature. A bear paw poppy is a wild flower found in an isolated corner of the Mojave de Desert and nowhere else in the world. In late spring, it briefly produces a delicate golden bloom, but for most of the year, the plant huddles unadorned and unnoticed on the parched earth. A califomica is a sufficiently rare that has been classified as an endangered species. In October 1990, more than three months after McCandless left Atlanta, a National Park Service ranger named Bud Walsh was sent into a black back country of Lake Mead National Recreation Area to tally bear paw poppies so that the federal government might better know just how scarce the plants were. A. califomica grows only in gypsum soil of a sort that occurs in abundance along the south shore of Lake Mead. So that is where Walsh led his team to, of rangers to conduct the botanical survey. They turned off Temple Bar Road, drove two road mile, roadless miles down the bed of de Detrital Wash, parked their rigs near the lake shore, and started scrambling up the steep east bank of the wash, a slope of crumbly white gypsum. A few minutes later, as they neared the top of the bank, one of the rangers happened to glance back down into the wash while pausing to catch his breath. Hey, look, down there, he yelled. What the hell is that? At the edge of the dry riverbed and a thicket of salt bush not far from where they had parked, a large object was concealed beneath a dun-colored tarpaulin. When the rangers pulled off the tarp, they found an old yellow Datsun without license plates. A note taped to the windshield read, This piece of shit has been abandoned. Whoever can get it out of here can have it. The doors had been left unlocked. The floorboards were plastered with mud apparently from a recent flash flood. When he looked inside, Wash found a Gian, uh, Giannini, Gianni guitar, a saucepan containing $4.93 of loose change, a football, a garage bag full of old clothes, a fishing rod and tackle, a new electric razor, a harmonica, a set of jumper cables, 25 pounds of rice, and in the glove compartment, the keys of the vehicle's ignition. The rangers searched the surrounding area for anything suspicious. According to Wash, they, then they departed. Five days later, after another ranger returned to the abandoned vehicle, managed to jumpstart it without difficulty, and drove it out of the National Park Service maintenance yard at Temple Bar. He drove it back at 60 miles an hour, Wash recalls, said the thing ran like a champ. Attempting to learn how, who owned the car, the rangers sent out a bulletin over the teletyped, to relevant law enforcement agencies and ran a detailed search of the computer records across the Southwest to see if the Dotson's S event was associated with any crimes and nothing turned up. By and by, the Rangers traced the car's serial number to a Hertz Corporation, the vehicle's original owner. Hertz said they had sold it as a used rental car many years earlier and had no interest in reclaiming it. Way, whoa, great, Wash remembers thinking, a freebie from the road gods. A car like this will be like will make a great undercover vehicle for drug interdiction. And indeed it did. Over the next three years, the Park Service used the Datsun to make undercover drug buys that led to numerous arrests in the crime-plagued National Recreation Area, including the bust of a high-volume methamphetamine dealer operating out of 
a trailer park near Bullhead City. We're still getting a lot of mileage out of that old car even now, Wash proudly reports, two and a half years after finding the Datsun. Put a few bucks of gas in the thing and it'll go all day. Real reliable. I kind of wondered why nobody ever showed up to reclaim it. The Datsun, of course, belonged to Chris McCandless. After piloting it, piloting it west out of Atlanta, he arrived at Lake Mead National Recreation Area July 6th, riding a giddy Emersonian high. Ignoring posted warnings that off-road driving is strictly forbidden, McCandless steered the Datsun off the pavement where it crossed a broad, sandy wash. He drove two miles down the riverbed to the south shore of the lake. The temperature was 120 degrees Fahrenheit. The empty desert stretched into the distance, shimmering in the heat. Surrounded by cholas, bursage, and comical scurrying of collared lizards, McCandless pitched his tent in the puny shade of a tamarisk and basked in the newfound freedom. Detrital Wash extends for more for some 50 miles from Lake Mead into the mountains, north of Kingman. It drains a big chunk of country. Most of the year, the wash is as dry as chalk. During the summer months, however, superheated air rises from the scorched earth like bubbles from the bottom of a boiling kettle, rushing heavenward in turbulent convection currents. Frequently, the updrafts create cells of muscular, anvil-headed Columbus clouds that rise Cumulus clouds that rise 30,000 feet or more above the Mojave. Two days after McCandless set out camp beside Lake Mead, an unusually robust wall of thunderheads reared up in the afternoon sky, and it began to rain very hard over much of the Detrital Valley. McCandless had, was camped at the edge of the wash, a couple of feet higher than the main channel, so when the bore of brown water came rushing down from the high country, he, was just enough to, he had just enough time to gather his tent and belongings and save them from being swept away. There was nowhere to move the car, however, as the only route of egress was now a foaming, full-blown river. As it turned out, the flash flood didn't have enough power to carry away the vehicle or even to do any lasting damage. But it did get the engine wet, so wet that when McCandless tried to start the car soon thereafter, the engine wouldn't catch, and in his impatience, he drained the battery. When the battery, with the battery dead, there was no way to get the Datsun running. If he hoped to get the car back on a paved road, McCandless had no choice but to walk out to notify the authorities of his predicament. If he went to the rangers, however, they would have some irksome questions for him. Why had he ignored posted regulations and driven down to the wash in the first place? Was he aware that the vehicle's registration had expired two years before and had not been renewed? Did he know that his driver's license was also expired and the vehicle was uninsured as well? Truthfully, responses to his queries were not likely to be well received by the rangers. McCandless could endeavor to explain that he answered to statutes of a higher order, that as a latter-day adherent to Henry David Thoreau, he took as gospel the essay on the duty of civil disobedience, and thus considered his moral responsibility to flout the laws of the state. It was improbable, however, that the deputies of the federal government would share in his point of view. There would be thickets of red tape to negotiate the fines to pay. His parents would no doubt be contacted. But there was a way to avoid such aggravation. He could simply abandon the Datsun and resume his odyssey on foot, and that's what he decided to do. Instead of feeling distraught over his turn of events, moreover, McCandless was exhilarated. He saw the flash flood as an opportunity to shed unnecessary ba baggage. He concealed the car as best he could beneath a brown tarp stripped in its Virginia plates and hid them. He buried his Winchester deer hunting rifle and a few other possessions that he might one day want to recover. Then in a gesture that would have done both Thoreau and Tolstoy proud, he arranged all his paper currency in a pile on the sand, a pathetic little stack of ones and fives and twenties, and put a match to it. $133 in legal tender was promptly reduced to ash and smoke. We know all of this because McCandless documented the burning of his money and most of the events that followed in a journey, journal snapshot album he would later leave with Wayne West as Westerberg for safekeeping before departing after, for Alaska. Although the tone of the journal written in the third person is a stilted self-consciousness voice, often veers toward melodrama and available evidence indicates that McCandless did not misrepresent the facts. Telling the truth was a credo to, he took seriously. 
After loading his few remaining possessions into a backpack, McCandless set out on July 10th to hike around Lake Mead. This, his journal acknowledges, turned out to be a tremendous mistake. In extreme July temperatures becomes delirious. Suffering from heat stroke, he managed to flag down some passing boaters who gave him a lift to Calville Bay, a marina near the west, of, west end of the lake where he stuck out his thumb and took to the road. McCandless tramped around the west for the next two months, spellbind, spellbound by the scale and power of the landscape, thrilled by minor brushes with the law, savoring the intermittent company of other vagabonds he met along the way. Allowing his life to be shaped by circumstance, he hitched the Lake Tahoe, hiked to the Sierra Nevada, and spent a day walking north on the Pacific Crest Trail before ex exiting the mountains and returning to the pavement. At the end of July, he accepted a ride from a man who called himself Crazy Ernie and offered McCandless a job on a ranch in Northern California. For photographs of the place show an unpainted, tumbled down house surrounded by goats and chickens, bed springs, broken televisions, shopping carts, old appliances, and mounds and mounds of garbage. After working there 11 days with six other vagabonds, it became clear to McCandless that Ernie had no intention of ever paying him, so he stole a red 10-speed bicycle from the clutter in his yard, pedaled to Chico, to Chico, and ditched the bike in a mall parking lot. Then he resumed a life of constant motion, riding his thumb north and west through Red Bluff, Weaverville, and Willow Creek. At Arcata, at Ar Arcata California, in the dripping wood, wood, redwood forest of the Pacific shore, McCandless turned right on U.S. Highway 101 and headed up the coast. 60 miles south of the Oregon line, near the town of Oric, a pair of drifters in an old van pulled over to consult their map when they noticed a boy crouching in the bushes off the side of the road. He was wearing long shorts and this really stupid hat, says Jan Burrs, a 41-year-old rubber tramp who was traveling through the West selling knickknacks at flea markets and swap meets with her boyfriend, Bob. He had a book about pants with him and he was using it to, it to pick and he was he had a book about plants with him and he was using it to pick berries collecting them in a gallon milk jug with the top cut off he looked pretty pitiful so i yelled hey you want to ride somewhere i thought maybe we could give him a meal or something we got to talking and he was a nice kid said his name was alex and he was big time hungry 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 but real happy said he'd been surviving on edible plants he identified from the book like he was real proud of it said he was tramping around the country, having a big old adventure. He told us about abandoning his car, about burning all his money. And I said, why would you want to do that? Claimed he didn't need money. I have a son about the same age Alex was, and we've been estranged for many years now. So I said to Bob, man, we gotta take this kid with us. You need to school him about some things. Alex took a ride with, from us up to Oric Beach, where we were staying and camped with us for a week. He was a really good kid. We thought the world of him. When he left, we never expected to hear from him again, but he made a point of staying in touch. For the next two years, Alex sent us a postcard every month or two. From Oric, McCandless continued north up the coast. He passed through Pistol River, Coos Bay, Seal Rock, Manzanita, Astoria, Poquam, Hump Tulips, Queets, Forks, Port, Ang Port Angeles, Port Townsend, Seattle. He was alone, as James Joyce wrote in Stephen Dedalus, his artist as a young man. He was upheated, happy, and near to the wild heart of life. He was alone and young and willful and wild-hearted, alone amid a waste of wild air and brackish waters and the sea harvest of shells and tangled and veiled gray sunlight. On August 10th, shortly before meeting Jan Burrs and Bob, McCandless had been ticketed ticketed for hitchhiking near Willow Creek in a gold mining country east of Eureka. In an uncharacteristic lapse, McCandless gave his parents Annandale address when the arresting officer demanded to know his permanent place of residence. The unpaid ticket appeared in Walton Billy's mailbox at the end of August. Walton Billy, terribly concerned over Chris's vanishing act, had by that time already contacted the Annandale police, who had been of no help. When the ticket arrived from California, they became frantic. One of their neighbors was the director of the U.S. Defense Intelligence Agency, and Walt approached this man, an army general, for advice. The general put in touch with a private investigator named Peter Kaltica, who'd done contract work for both the DIA and CIA. It was the best the general assured Walt. If Chris was out there, Kaltica 
would find him. Using the Willow Creek ticket as a starting point, Kalitka launched an extremely thorough search, chasing down leads that led as far afield as Europe and South Africa. His efforts, however, turned up nothing until December when he learned from an inspection of tax records that Chris had given away his college fund to Oxfam. That really scared us, said Walt. By that point, we had absolutely no idea what Chris could be up to. The hitchhiking ticket just didn't make any sense. He loved that Dotson so much. It was mind-boggling to me that he would ever abandon it and travel on foot. Although in retrospect, I guess it shouldn't have surprised me. Chris was very much the, of the school that you should own nothing except what you carry on your back at a dead run. As Kalitka was trying to put to pick up Chris's scent in California, the canvas was already far away, hitching across east across the Cascade Range, across the sagebrush uplands and lava beds of the Columbia River Basin, through, across Idaho Panhandle into Montana. There, outside Cut Bank, he crossed paths with Wayne Westerberg, and by the end of the September was working for him in Carthage. When Westerberg had j was jailed and the work came to a halt, and with the winter coming on, McCandless headed for warmer claims. On October 28th, he caught a ride with a long-haul trucker into Needles, California. Overjoyed upon reaching the Colorado River, McCandless wrote in his journal, then he left the highway and started walking south through the desert following the riverbank. Twelve miles on foot brought him to Topic, Arizona, a dusty way station along Interstate 40 where the freeway intersects with the California border. While he was in town, he noticed a second-hand aluminum canoe for sale and on impulse decided to buy it and paddle it down to the Colorado River for the Gulf of California, nearly 400 miles to the south across the border with Mexico. This lower stretch of river from Hoover Dam to the Gulf was little in common with the unbridled torrent that explodes through the Grand Canyon, some 250 miles upstream from Topic. Emasculated by dams and diversion canals, the lower Colorado burbles indolently from reservoir to reservoir through some of the hottest, starkest country in the continent. McCandless was stirred by the austerity of his landscape, by his saline beauty, the desert sharpened the sweet ache of his longing, amplified it, gave shape to it in sear geology and clean slant of light. From Topic McCandless paddled south down Lake Havasu, under the bleached dome of sky, huge and empty. He made a brief excursion up the Bill Williams River, a tributary of the Colorado, then continued downstream through Colorado River Indian River Reservation, the Cibola National Wildlife Refuge, the Imperial National Wildlife Re Refuge. He drifted past Saguars and Alka Alkali Flats, camped beneath es escarpments of naked Precambrian stone. In the distant spiky chocolate brown mountains floated on eerie pools of mirage. Leaving the river for a day to track a herd of wild horses, he came across a sign warning that he was trespassing on the U.S. Army's highly restricted Yuma-proving ground. McCandless was deterred not in the least. At the end of November, he paddled through Yuma, where he stepped long enough to replenish his provisions and sent a postcard to Westerberg in care of Glory House, the Sioux Falls work release facility where Westerberg was doing time. Hey, Wayne, the car reads. How's it going? I hope that your situation has improved since the time we last spoke. I've been tramping around Arizona for about a month now. This is a good state. There are all kinds of fantastic scenery and the climate is wonderful. But apart from sending greetings, the main purpose of this card is to thank you once again for all your hospitality. It's rare to find a man as generous and good natured as you are. Sometimes I wish I hadn't met you though. Tramping is too easy with all this money. My days were more exciting when I was one when one was penniless and had to forage around for the next meal. If I couldn't make it now without money, however, as there is very little fruiting agriculture down here as, it, as at this time. Please thank Kevin again for all the clothes he gave me. I would have froze to death without them. I hope we got that book to you. Wayne, you really should read War and Peace. I meant it when I said you had one of the biggest characters of any man I'd met. That is a very powerful and highly symbolic book. It has things in it that I think you will understand, things that escape most people. As for me, I've decided that I'm going to live this life from time for, for some time to come. The freedom and simple beauty of it is just too good to pass up. One day I'll be back with to you, Wayne, and repay some of your kindness. A case of Jack Daniels, maybe. 
Till then, I'll always think of you as a friend. God bless you, Alexander. On December 2nd, he reached the Morelos Dam and the Mexican border, worried that he would be denied entry because he was carrying no identification. He sneaked into Mexico by paddling through the dam's open floodgates and shooting the spillway below. Alex looks quickly around for signs of trouble, his journal records, but his entry of Mexico is either unnoticed or ignored. Alexander is jubilant. His jubilance, however, was short-lived. Below the Morelos Dam, the river turns into a maze of irrigation channels, marshland, and dead-end channels, among which McCandless repeatedly lost his way. Canals break off in multitude of directions. Alex is dumbfounded, encounters some canal officials who speak a little English. They tell him he has been traveling south but west and is headed for the center of the Baja Peninsula. Alex is crushed, pleads and persists that there must be some waterway in the Gulf of California. They stare at Alex and think him crazy. But then a passionate conversation breaks out amongst them, accompanied by Max, maps and the flourish of pencils. After 10 minutes, they present to Alex a route which will apparently take him to the ocean. He is overjoyed and hope burst back into his heart. Following the map, he reverses back up the canal until he comes upon the Canal de Independencia, which he takes east. According to the map, this canal should bisect the Well Teco Canal, which will turn south and flow all the way to the ocean. But his hopes are quickly smashed when the canal comes to a dead end in the middle of the desert. A reconnaissance mission reveals, however, that Alex has merely run back into the bed of the now dead and dry Colorado River. He discovers another canal about a half mile on the other side of the river bed. He decides to portage to this canal. It took McCandless most of three days to carry the canoe and his gear to the new canal. The journal entry for December 5th records, at last, Alex finds that he believes to be the Well Teco Canal and heads south. Worries and fears return as the canal grows even smaller. Local inhabitants help him portage around the barrier. Alex finds Mexicans to be warm, friendly people, much more hospitable than Americans. December 6th, small but dangerous waterfalls litter the canal. December 9th, all hopes collapse. The canal does not reach the ocean, but merely peters out into a vast swamp. Alex is utterly confounded decides he must be close to the ocean and elects to try and work his way through the swamp to the sea. Alex becomes progressively lost to the point where he must push canoe through reeds and drag it through the mud. All is in display, despair. Find some dry ground to camp and swamp at sundown. Next day on December 10th, Alex resumes quest for an opening to the sea, but only becomes more confused, traveling in circles. Completely demoralized and frustrated, he lays in his canoe at day's end and weeps. But then by fantastic chance, he comes upon Mexican duck hunting guides who can speak English. He tells them his story and his quest for the sea, and they say there is no outlet to the sea. But then one among them agrees to tow Alex back to his base swamp behind a small motor skiff and drives him to and the canoe and the bed of the pickup truck to the ocean if it's a miracle. The duck hunters dropped him in El Golfo de Santa Clara, the finishing village on the Gulf of California. From there, McCandless took to the sea, traveling south down the eastern edge of the Gulf. Having reached his destination, McCandless slowed his pace, and his mood became more contemplative. He took photographs of a tarantula, plaintive sunsets, windswept dunes, and the long curve of empty coastline. The journal entries become short and perfunctory. He wrote fewer than a hundred words over the month that followed. On December 14th, weary of paddling, he hauled the canoe far up the beach, climbed a sandstone bluff, and set up camp on the edge of a desolate plateau. He stayed up there for 10 days until high winds forced him to seek refuge in a cave midway up the precipitous face of the bluff, where he remained for another 10 days. He greeted the new year by observing the full moon as it rose over the Gran Desierto, the Great Desert, 1,700 square miles of shifting dunes, the largest expanse of pure sand desert in North America. A day later, he resumed paddling down the barren shore. His journal entry for January 11, 1991 begins a very fateful day. After traveling some distance south, he beached the canoe on a sandbar far from shore to observe the powerful tides. At an hour later, violent gusts started blowing down from the desert, and the wind and tidal reaps conspired to carry him out to sea. The water by this time was a chaos of whitecaps that threatened to the swamp and capsize his tiny craft. The wind increased to gale force. The whitecaps grew into high breaking waves. 
In great frustration, the journal reads, he screams and beats canoe with oar. The oar breaks. Alex has one spare oar. He calms himself. If loses, second oar is dead. Finally, through, through extreme effort and much cursing, he manages to beach canoe on jetty and collapses exhausted on sand at sundown. This incident led Alexander to decide to abandon canoe and return north. On January 16th, McCandless left the stubby metal boat on a hammock of dune green southwest of El Golfo de Santa Clara and started walking up to the deserted beach. He had not seen or talked to another soul in 36 days. For that entire period, he subsisted on nothing but five pounds of rice and what marine life he could pull from the sea, an experience that would later convince him that he could survive on similarly meager rations in the Alaska, Alaska bush. He was back at the United States border on January 18th. Caught by immigration authorities trying to slip into the country without ID, he spent a night in custody before concocting a story that sprang him from the slammer, minus his 38 caliber handgun, a handful of Colt Python he, to which he was much attached. McCandla spent the next six weeks on the move across Southwest traveling as far east as Houston and as far west as the Pacific coast. To avoid being rolled by the unsavory characters who ruled the streets and freeway overpasses where he slept, he learned to bury his money he had before and he had before entering the city, then recover it on the way out of town. On February 3rd, according to his journal, McCandless went to Los Angeles to get an idea, ID and a job, but feels extremely uncomfortable in society now and must return to road immediately. Six days later, camped at the bottom of the Grand Canyon with Thomas and Karen, a young German couple who had given him a ride, he wrote, can this be the same Alex that set out on July in July of 1990? Malnutrition and the road have taken their toll on his body, over 25 pounds lost, but his spirit is soaring. On February 24th, seven and a half months after he abandoned the Datsun, McCandless returned to Detrital Wash. The Park Service had long since impounded the vehicle, but he unearthed his old Virginia plates, SJF-421, and a few belongings he bur buried there. Then he hitched into Las Vegas and found a job at an Italian restaurant. Alexander buried his backpack in the desert on 227 and entered Las Vegas with no money and no ID, the journal tells us. He lived on the streets with bums, tramps, and winos for several weeks. Vegas was not, would not be the end of the story, however. On May 10th, Itchy Feet returned and Alex left his job in Vegas, retrieved his backpack, and hit the road again. Though he found that if you were stupid enough to bury a camera underground, you, you won't be taking any pictures with it afterwards. Thus, the story has no picture book for the period of May 10th, 1991 through January 7th, 1992. But this is not important. It is the experiences, the memories, the great triumphant joy of living to the fullest extent to which real meaning is found. God is great to be alive. Thank you. Thank you. Chapter 7, The Stampede Trail. Nature was here something savage and awful, although beautiful. I looked with awe at the ground I trod on to see what the powers had made there and the form and fashion and material of their work. This was that earth of which we have heard, made out of chaos and old night. Here was no man's garden, but the unhandselled globe. It was not lawn, nor pasture, nor mead, nor woodland, nor lee, nor arable, nor wasteland. It was the fresh and natural surface of the plant of the planet Earth, as it was made forever and ever to be the dwelling of man, we say, so nature made it. And man may use it if he can. Man was not to be associated with it. It was matter, vast, terrific. Not his mother Earth that we have heard of, not for him to tread on or to be buried in. No, it were being too familiar even to let his bones lie there, the home this of necessity and fate. There was clearly felt the presence of a force not bound to be kind to man. It was a place of heathenism and superstitious rites, to be uninhibited, to be inhibited by men nearer of kin to the rocks and to wild animals than we. What is it to be admitted to a museum to see a myriad of particular things compared with being shown some star's surface, some hard matter in its home? I stand in awe of my body. This matter of which I am bound has come, become so strange to me. I fear no spirits, ghost of which I am. That my body might, but I fear bodies. I tremble to meet them. What is this titan that has possession of me? Talk of mysteries. 
Think of your life in nature, daily to be shown matter, to be, come in contact with it. Rocks, trees, wind on our cheeks, the solid earth, the actual world, the common sense, contact, contact. Who are we? Where are we? Henry David Thoreau. A year and a week after Chris McCandless decided not to attempt to cross the Telekanika River, I stand on the opposite bank, the eastern side, the highway side, the gate, and gaze into the churning water. I too hope to cross the river. I want to visit the bus. I want to see where McCandless died to better understand why. It is a hot, humid afternoon, and the river is livid with runoff from the fast melting snowpacks that still blankets the glaciers in the higher elevations of the Alaska Range. Today, the water looks considerably lower than it looks in the photograph McCandless took 12 months ago, but to try to ford the river here in thundering midsummer flood is nevertheless unthinkable. The water is too deep, too cold, too fast. As I stare into the Telekanika, I can hear rocks the size of bowling balls grinding along the bottom, rolled downstream by the powerful current. I'd be swept from my feet within a few yards of leaving the bank and pushed into the canyon immediately below, which pinches the river into a boil of rapids that continues without interruption for the next five miles. Unlike McCandless, however, I have in my backpack a 136, 360 scale topographic map. That is a map on which one inch represents one mile. Exquisitely detailed, it indicates the half that half a mile downstream and the throat of the canyon is a gouging station that is built by the U.S. Geological Survey. Unlike McCandless too, I am here with three companions, Alaskans Roman Dial and Dan Soley, and a friend of Romans from California, Andrew Lisk. The gouging station can't be seen from where the stampede trail comes down to the river, but after 20 minutes of fighting our way through the snarl of spruce and dwarf birch, Roman shouts, I see it, there, a hundred yards further. We arrive to find an inch thick steel cable spanning the gorge, stretched between a 15 foot tower on our side of the river and an outcrop on the far shore 450 feet away. The cable was erected in 1970 to chart the Telekanika's seasonal fluctuations. Hydrologists traveled back and forth above the river by means of an aluminum basket that is suspended from the cable with pulleys. From the basket, they would drop a weighted plumb line to measure the river's depth. The station was decommissioned nine years ago for lack of funds, at which time the basket was supposed to be chained and locked to the tower on our side, the highway side of the river. When we climbed to the top of the tower, however, the basket wasn't there. Looking across the rushing water, I could see it over the distant shore, the bus side of the canyon. Some local hunters, it turns out, had cut the chain, ridden the basket across, and secured it to the far side in order to make it harder for outsiders to cross the Telekanika and trespass on their turf. When McCandless tried to walk out of the bush one year ago the previous week, the basket was in the same place as it is now, on his side of the canyon. If he'd known about it, crossing the Telekanika to safety would have been a trivial matter, because he had no topographic math. However, he had no way of conceiving that salvation was so close at hand. Andy Horowitz, one of McCandless's friends on the Woodson High Countryside team, had mused that Chris was born into the wrong century. He was looking for more adventure and freedom than today's society gives people. In coming to Alaska, McCandless yearned to wander uncharted country to find a blank spot on the map. In 1992, however, there was no mere blank spot on the map, not in Alaska, not anywhere. But Chris, with his idiosyncratic logic, came up with an elegant solution to his dilemma. He simply got rid of the map. In his own mind, if nowhere else, the, the tierra would thereby become incognita. Because he, looked, because he lacked a good map, the cable spanning the river also remained incognito. Studying the Telekanika's violent flow, McCandless thus mistakenly concluded that it was impossible to reach the eastern shore. Thinking that his escape route had been cut off, he returned to the bus, a reasonable course of action, giving his topographical ignorance. But why did he stay at the bus and starve? Why come August, didn't he try once more to cross the Telekanika when it would have been running significantly lower when it had been safe to ford? Puzzled by these questions and troubled, I am hoping that the rusking hulk of Fairbanks bus 142 will yield some clues. But to reach the bus, I too need to cross the river and the aluminum tram is still chained to the far shore. 
Standing atop the tower anchoring the eastern end of the span, I attach myself to the cable with rock climbing hardware and begin to pull myself across hand over hand, executing what mountaineers call the Tyrolean Traverse. This turns out to be more strenuous prop proposition than I had anticipated. 20 minutes after starting out, I finally haul myself onto the outcrop on the other side, completely spent, so wasted I can barely raise my arms. After at last catching my breath, I climb into the basket, a rectangular aluminum car two feet wide by four feet long, disconnected the chain, and head back to the eastern side of the canyon to ferry my companion across. The cable sags noticeably over the middle of the river, so when I cut loose from the outcrop, the car accelerates quickly under its own weight, rolling faster and faster along the steel strand, seeking the lowest point. It's a thrilling ride and faster along the steel strand. It's a thrilling ride, zipping over the rapids at 20 or 30 miles per hour. I hear an involuntary bark of fright leap from my throat before I realize that I'm in no danger and regain my composure. After all four of us are on the western side of the gorge, 30 minutes of rough bushwhacking returns us to the stampede trail. The 10 miles of trail we have already covered, the section between our parked vehicles and the river, were gently well marked and relatively heavily traveled. But the 10 miles to come have an utterly different character. Because so few people cross Telekanika during the spring and summer months, much of the route is so indistinct and overgrown with brush. Immediately past the river, the trail curves the southwest up the bed of the fast flowing creek. And because beavers have built a network of elaborate dams across this creek, the route leads directly through a three acre expanse of standing water. The beaver ponds are never more than chest deep, but the water is cold, and as we slosh forward, our feet churn the muck on the bottom with, into a foul-smelling miasma of decomposing slime. The trail climbs a hill beyond the uppermost pond, then rejoins the twisting rocky creek bed before ascending again into a jungle of scrubby vegetation. The going never gets exceedingly difficult, but the 15-foot high tangle of alder pressing in from both sides of gloomy, claustrophobic oppressive. Clouds of mosquitoes materials materialize out of the sticky heat. Every few minutes, the insect's piercing whine is supplanted by the boom of distant thunder, rumbling over the tiaga from a wall of thunderbeds rearing darkly on the horizon. Thickets of black buckbrush leave a crosshatch of bloody lacerations on my skins, piles of bare scat on the trail, and at one point, a set of fresh grizzly tracks, each print half again as long as a size nine boot print put me on edge. None of us had a gun. Hey, Grizz, I yell out at the undergrowth, hoping to avoid surprise encounter. Hey, Bear, just passing through, no reason to get riled. I have been to Alaska about some 20 times during the past 20 years to climb mountains, to work as a carpenter and a commercial salmon fisherman and a journalist, to goof off, to poke around. I've spent a lot of time alone in the country over the course of this many visits and usually relish it. Indeed, I had intended to make this trip to the bus myself, and when my friend Roman invited himself and two others along, I was annoyed. Now, however, I was grateful for their company. There is something disquieting about this gothic overground landscape. It feels more malevolent than other more remote corners of the state I know. The tundra-wrapped slopes of the Brooks Range the cloud forest of the Alexander Archipelago, even the frozen gale-swept heights of the Denali Massif. I'm happy as hell but I, that I'm out here alone, that I'm not out here alone. At 9 p.m., we round a bend in the trail, and there at the edge of the small clearing is the bus. Pink bush bunches of fireweed choke the vehicle's wheel wells, growing higher than the axles. Fairbanks Bus 142 is parked beside the Copus of Aspen, 10 yards back from the brow of a modest cliff on a shank of high ground overlooking the confluence of the Sushana River and a smaller, smaller tributary. It's an appealing setting, open and filled with light. It's easy to see why McCandless decided to make his base camp. We pause some distance away from the bus and stare at it for a while in silence. Its paint is chalky and peeling. Several windows are missing. Hundreds of delicate bones litter the clearing around the vehicle scattered among thousands of porcupine quills. The remains of the small game that make up the bulk of McCandless's diet. And at the perimeter of his boneyard lies one much larger skeleton, that of the moose he shot, and subsequent agonized over. 
When I questioned Gordon Sam Samuel and Ken Thompson shortly after they discovered McCandless's body, both men insisted adamantly and unequivocally that the big skeleton was the remains of a caribou, and they derided the greenhorn's ignorance in mistaking the animal he killed for a moose. Wolves had scattered the bones some, Thompson had told me, but it was obvious that the animal was a caribou. The kid didn't know what the hell he was doing up here. It was definitely a caribou, Samuel said, had scornfully piped in. When I read it on the paper that he thought he'd shot a moose, that told me right there he wasn't no Alaskan. There's a big difference between a moose and a caribou. A real big difference. You'd have to be pretty stupid not to be able to tell them apart. Trusting Samuel and Thompson, veteran Alaskan hunters who'd killed many moose and caribou between them, I duly reported McCandless's mistake in the article I wrote for Outside, therefore, therefore confirming the opinion of countless readers that McCandless was ridiculously ill-prepared, that he had no business heading into the wilderness, let alone into the big league wilds of the last frontier. Not only did McCandless die because he was stupid, one Alaska correspondent observed, but the scope of his self-styled adventure was so small as to ring pathetic, squawking in a wrecked bus, Squatting in a red, wrecked bus a few miles out of Healy, potting jays and squirrels, mistaking a caribou for a moose, pretty hard to do. Only one word for the guy, incompetent. Among the le letters lambasting McCandless, virtually all those I received mentioned his misidentification of the caribou as proof that he didn't know the first thing about surviving in the back country. What the angry letter writers didn't know, however, was that the ungulate McCandless shot his was exactly what he'd said it was. Contrary to what I reported in Outside, the animal was a moose. As a close, as a close examination of the beast remains now indicate, the several of McCandless's photographs of the kill light later confirmed beyond all doubt. The boy made some mistakes on the stampede trail, but confusing a caribou with a moose wasn't among them. Walking past the moose bones, I approached the vehicle and stepped through an emergency exit at the back. Immediately inside the door is the torn mattress stained and moldering on which McCandless expired. For some reason, I had taken aback to find the collection of his possessions spread across its ticking a green plastic canteen. A tiny bottle of water purification tablets, a used up cylinder of chapstick, a pair of insulated flight pants of the type sold in military surplus stores, a paperback copy of the bestseller O, o Jerusalem, its spine broken wool mittens, a bottle of muscle, insect repellent, a full box of matches, and a pair of brown rubber work boots with the name Galleon written across the cuffs and paint bl faint black ink. Despite the missing windows, the air inside the caverner's vehicle is stale and musty. Wow, Roman remarks, it smells like dead birds in here. A moment later, I come across the source of an odor. A plastic gar garbage bag filled with feathers down and severed wings of several birds. It appears that McCandless was saving them to insulate his clothing, or perhaps to make a feather pillow. Toward the front of the bus, McCandless pots and dishes are stacked on a makeshift plywood table beside a kerosene lamp. A long leather scabbard is expertly tooled with the initials R.E., the sheaf of the ma machete Ronald France gave McCandless when he left Salton City. The boy's toothbrush rests next to a half-empty tube of Colgate, a packet of dental floss, and a gold molar crown that, according to his journal, fell off his tooth three weeks into his sojourn. A few inches away sits a skull the size of a watermelon, thick ivory fangs jutting from its bleached maxil. It is a bear skull, the remains of a grizzly shot by someone who visited the bus years before McCandless's tenure. A message scratched in Chris's tidy hand brackets, a cranial bullet hole. All hail the phantom bear, the beast within us, Alexander Supertramp, May 1992. Looking up, I noticed that the sheet metal walls of the vehicle are covered with graffiti left by numerous visitors over the years. Roman points out a message he wrote when he stayed in the bus four years ago during the traverse of the Alaskan range. Noodle eaters en route to Lake Clark, 889. Like Roman, most people scrawled little more of their names in a date. The longest, most eloquent graffito was the several inscribed by McCandless, the proclamation of joy that begins with a nod to his favorite Roger Miller song, Two Years He Walks the Earth. No phone, no pool, no pets, no cigarettes, ultimate freedom, an extremist, an aesthetic voyager whose name, home, is the road. Immediately below his manifesto squats the stove fabricated from a rusty oil drum. 
A 12-foot section of spruce trunk is jammed into its open doorway, and across the log are draped two pairs of torn Levi's laid out as if to dry. One pair of jeans, waist 30 and seam 32, is patched crudely with silver duct tape, and the other pair has been repaired more carefully with scraps from a faded bedspread stitched over gaping holes in the knees and seat. This latter pair also sports a belt fashioned from a strip of blanket. McCandless, it occurs to me, must have been forced to make a belt after growing so thin that his pants wouldn't stay up without it. Sitting down on the steel cut, across from the stove to mull over this eerie tableau, I encounter evidence of McCandless's presence wherever my vision rests. Here are his toenail clippers, over there his green nylon tent spread over a missing window in the front door. His Kmart hiking boots are arranged neatly beneath the stove as though he'd soon be returning to lace them up and hit the trail. I feel uncomfortable as if I were intruding, a voyeur who has slipped into McCandless's bedroom while he is momentarily away. Suddenly queasy, I stumble out of the bus to walk along the river and breathe some fresh air. An hour later, we build a fire outside of the fading light, the rain squalls down past, and we write he have rinsed the haze from the atmosphere, and distant backlit hills stand out in crisp detail. A stripe of incandescent sky burns beneath the cloud base on the northwestern horizon. Roman unwraps some stakes from a moose he shot in the Alaska range last September and lays them across the fire on a blackened grill. The grill McCandless used for broiling his game. Moose fat pops the soot and sizzles into the coals. Eating the grisly meat with our fingers, we slap at mosquitoes and talk about this peculiar person whom none of us ever met, trying to get a handle on how he came so grief, trying to understand why some people seem to despise him so intensely for ha having died here. By design, McCandless came into the country with insufficient provisions, and he lacked certain pieces of equipment deemed essential by many Alaskans, a large caliber rifle, map, and compass, and axe. This has been regarded as evidence not just of stupidity, but of the even greater sin of arrogance. Some critics have even drawn parallels between McCandless and the Arctic's most infamous tragic figure, Sir John Franklin, a 19th century British naval officer whose smugness and hauteur contributed to some 140 deaths, including his own. In 1819, the Admiralty assigned Franklin to lead an expedition into the wilderness of northwestern Canada. Two years out of England, winter overtook the small party as they plodded across an expanse of tundra so vast and empty that they christened it the Barrens, the name by which its men to subsequent on lichens scraped from boulders, singed deer hide, savage, scavenged animal bones, and their own boot leather, and finally one another's flesh. Before the ordeal was over, at least two men had been murdered and eaten. The suspected murderer had been summar summarily ex executed, and eight others were dead from sickness and starvation. Franklis was himself within a day or two of expiring when he and the other survivors were rescued by a band of Metis. An affable Victorian gentleman, Franklin was said to be a good-natured bumbler, dogged, dogged, and clueless, with the naive ideals of a childish and a disdain for acquire, acquiring backcountry skills. He had been woefully unprepared to lead an Arctic expedition, and upon entering to England, he was known as the man who ate his shoes. Yet the sub subricate was uttered more often with awe than with ridicule. He was hailed as a national hero, promoted to the rank of captain by the Admiralty, paid handsomely to write an account of his ordeal, and in 1825 given command of a second Arctic expedition. That trip was well, relatively uneventful, but in 1845, hoping fully, finally to discover the fabled Northwest Passage, Franklin made the mistake of returning to the Arctic for a third time. He and the 128 men under his command were never heard from again. Evidence unearthed by the 40-odd expeditions sent to search for them eventually established that all had perished, the victims of scurvy, starvation, and unspeakable suffering. When McCandless turned up dead, he was likened to Franklin not simply because both men starved, but also because both were perceived to have lacked the requisite humility. Both were thought to have possessed insufficient respect for the land. A century after Franklin's death, the eminent explorer 
Stephenson pointed out that the English explorer had never taken to the trouble to learn the survival skills practiced by the Indians and the Eskimos, peoples who had managed to flourish for generations, bringing up their children and taking care of their age. In the same harsh country that killed Franklin, Stephenson conveniently neglected to mention that many, many Indians and Eskimos had starved in the northern latitudes as well. McCandless's arrogance was not the same strain as Franklin's, however. Franklin regarded nature as an antagonist that would inevitably submit to force, good breeding, and Victorian dis discipline. Instead of living in concert with the land, instead of relying on the country for sustenance, as the natives did, he attempted to insulate himself from the northern environment with ill-suited military tools and traditions. McCandless, on the other hand, went too far in the opposite direction. He tried to live entirely off the country, and he tried to do it without bothering to master beforehand the full repertoire of crucial skills. It probably misses the point, though, to castigate McCandless for being ill-prepared. He was green and he overestimated his resilience, but he was sufficiently skilled to last 16 weeks on little more than his wits and 10 pounds of rice, and he was fully aware that he entered the bush that he had given himself perilously slim margin of for error. He knew precisely what was at stake. It is hardly unusual for a young man to be drawn to a pursuit considered reckless by his elders, engaging in risky behavior and a rite of passage in our own culture no less than most others. Danger has always held a certain allure that in large part is why so many teenagers drive too fast and drink too much and take too many drugs. Why has it always been so easy for nations to recruit young men to go to war? It can be argued that youthful daring do is in fact an evolutionarily adaptive, a behavior encoded in our genes. McCandless and his fashion merely took risk taking to its logical extreme. He had need to test himself in ways as he was fond of saying, that mattered. He possessed grand, some would say grandiose, spiritual ambitions. According to the moral absolutism of, that characterizes McCandless's beliefs, a challenge is, in which a successful outcome is assured isn't a challenge at all. It is not merely the young, of course, who are drawn to hazardous undertakings. John Moore is remembered primarily as a no-nonsense conservationist and a founding president of the Sierra Club, but he was also a bold adventurer, a fearless fearless scrambler of peaks, glaciers, and waterfalls, whose best-known essay includes a riveting account of nearly falling to his death in 1872 while ascending California's Mount Ritter. In another essay, Moore raptoriously describes riding out a ferocious Sierra gale by choice in the uppermost branches of a 100-foot Douglas fir. Never before did I enjoy so noble an exhilaration of motion. The slender tops fairly flapped and swished in the passionate torrent, bending and swirling backward and forward, round and round, tracing indescribable combinations of vertical and horizontal curves, while I clung with muscles firm braced like a bobo link on a reed. He was 36 years old at the time. One suspects that Moore wouldn't have thought McCandless terribly odd or incomprehensible. Even stayed Prissy Thoreau, who famously de declared that it was enough to have traveled a good deal in Concord, felt compelled to visit the more fearsome wilds of 19th century Maine and climb Mount Katahdin. His ascent of the peak's savage and awful though beautiful ramparts shocked and frightened him, but it also induced a giddy sort of awe. The disquietude he felt on Katahdin's granite heights inspired some of his most powerful writing and profoundly colored the way he thought thereafter about the earth and its coarse, undomesticated state. Unlike Moore and Thoreau, McCandless went into the wilderness not primarily to ponder nature or the world at large, but rather to explore the inner country of his own soul. He soon discovered, however, that Moore and Thoreau already knew an extended stay in the wilderness inevitably directs one's attention outward as much as inward, and it is impossible to live off the land without developing both a subtle understanding of it and a strong emotional bond with that land and all it holds. The entries in McCandless's journal contain few abstractions about wilderness, or for that matter, few ruminations of any kind. There is scant mention of surrounding scenery. Indeed, as Roman's friend Andrew Lisk points out upon reading a photo photocopy of the journal, these entries are almost entirely about what he ate. He wrote about hardly anything except food. Andrew is not exaggerating. The journal is little more than a tally of plants foraged and game killed. 
It would probably be a mistake, however, to conclude thereby that McCandless failed to appreciate the beauty of the country around him, that he was unmoved by the power of the landscape. As cultural ecologist Paul Shepard has observed, the nomadic Bedouin does not dote on scenery, paint landscapes, or compile a non-utilitarian natural history. His life is so profoundly in transaction with nature that there is no place for abstraction or aesthetics or a nature philosophy, which can be separated from the rest of his life. Nature and his relation to it are deadly serious matter, prescribed by convention, mystery, and danger. His personal leisure is aimed away from idle amusement or detached tampering, with nature's possesses. But built into his life is awareness of that presence, of the terrain, of the unpredictable weather, of the narrow margin by which he is sustained. Much the same could be said of McCandless during the months he spent beside the Sushana River. It would be easy to stereotype Christopher McCandless as another boy who felt too much, a loopy young man who read too many books and lacked even a medicom of common sense. But the stereotype isn't a good fit. McCandless wasn't some feckless slacker, adrift and confused, racked by existential despair. To the contrary, his life hummed with meanings and purpose. But the meaning he wrestled, rested with existent, from existence lay beyond the comfortable path. McCandless distrusted the value of things that came easily. He demanded much of himself, more in the end than he ever could deliver. Trying to explain McCandless's unorthodox behavior, some people have made much to the fact that, like John Westerman, he was small in stature and may have suffered from a short man's complex, a fundamental insecurity that drove him to prove his manhood by means of extreme physical challenges. Others have posited that an unresolved opidol, opidol conflict was at the root of his fatal odyssey, although there may have been some truth to both hypotheses. This sort of posthumous off-the-rack psychoanalysis is a dubious, highly speculative enterprise that inevitably demeans and trivializes the absent anosand. It's not clear that much of the value is learned by reducing Chris McCandless's strange spiritual quest to a list of pat psychological disorders. Roman and Andrew and I stare into the embers and talk about McCandless late into the night. Roman, 32, inquisitive and outspoken, was a doctor, has a doctorate in biology from Stanford and an abiding distrust of conventional wisdom. He spent his adolescence in the same Washington, D.C. suburbs as McCandless and found them every bit as stifling. His first came, he first came to Alaska as a nine-year-old to visit a trio of uncles who mined coal in Yusabeli, a big strip, strip mine operation a few miles east of Healy, and immediately fell in love with everything about the North. Over the years that followed, he returned repeatedly to the 49th state. In 1977, after graduating from high school as a 16-year-old at the top of his class, he moved to Fairbanks and made Alaska his permanent home. These days, Roman teaches at a Alaska Pacific University in Anchorage and enjoys statewide, statewide renown for a long, brash string of backcountry escapades. He has, among other feats, traveled the entire thousand-mile length of the Brooks Range by foot and paddle, skied 250 miles across the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge in sub-zero winter cold, traversed the 700-mile crest of the Alaska Range, and pioneered more than 30 first ascents of northern peaks and crags. And Roman doesn't see a great deal of difference between his own wildly respected deeds and McCandless's adventures, except that McCandless has the misfortune to perish. I bring up McCandless's hubris and dumb mistakes he made, the two or three readily unavoidable avoidable blunders that ended up costing him his life. Sure, he screwed up, Roman answers, but I admire what he was trying to do. Living completely off the land like that, month after month, is incredibly difficult. I've never done it, and I'd bet you very few, if any of the people who call McCandless incompetent, have ever done it either, not for more than a week or two. Living in the interior bush for more, an extended period, subsisting on nothing except what the hunt and gather, most people have no idea how, how hard that actually is. And McCandless almost pulled it off. I guess I just can't help identifying with the guy Roman allows as he pokes the coals with a stick. I hate to admit it, but not so many years ago, it could easily have been me in this kind of a predicament. When I first started coming to Alaska, I think I was probably a lot like McCandless just as green, just as eager. And I'm sure there are plenty of other Alaskans who had a lot of common with McCandless when they first got here too. 
including many of his critics, which is maybe why they're so hard on him. Maybe McCandless reminds them a little too much of their former selves. Roman's observations underscore how difficult it is for those of us preoccupied with the humdrum concerns of adulthood to recall how forcefully we were once buffeted by the passions and longings of youth. As Everett Roos's fathers mused years after his 20-year-old son vanished in the desert, the older person does not realize the soul's flights of adolescence. I think we all poorly understood Everett. Roman, Andrew, and I stay up well past midnight trying to make sense of McCandless's life and death, yet his essence remains slippery, vague, and elusive. Gradually, the conversation lags and falters. When I drift away from the fire to find a place to throw down my sleeping bag, the first faint smear of dawn is already bleaching the rim of the northeastern sky. Although the mosquitoes are thick tonight and the bus would not, no doubt offer some refuge, I decide not to bed down inside the Fairbanks 142. Nor, I note, before sinking into a dreamless sleep, do the others.